My name is Mircea Budulan and I'm a deputy board member for the Psychosynthesis Association in Sweden. The following is an event we organized for the members for our association. Our guest is Siobhan Tinker, who has been working with psychotherapy, counseling and supervision of individuals and groups for more than 20 years. Her work has also involved being a tutor and lecturer on counseling training workshops and courses. She also worked in a corporate setting with EAP, which is Employee Assistance Program, and during this past year had worked with giving support to the British frontline staff of NHS. During the past years, she has also organized widow groups working with deep existential themes such as death, loss, and grief. Despite the serious topics encountered in her work, creativity and humor are also very important to be integrated and manifested. Therefore, she writes regularly a humoristic blog from the perspective of a fictional therapist who tells the story of her work life. It has definitely been a pleasure and honor to have this conversation with Siobhan about all the aforementioned areas of her experience, and I hope you will enjoy it as well. So, thank you so much for honoring our invitation, Siobhan, and um, you're very welcome to, to, to be here on this inspiring evening with us. So welcome, Siobhan. Thank you. I feel very touched by that introduction. Um, thank you from both of you, both Anna and, and yourself, Mirta. So um, what I would like to do is just like, um, uh, I'm going to have the speaker view, right? OK. Uh, will I be able to see you, Mircea, when you're um, asking me questions, or do I have to look at myself, which is not great news, right? Um, yes, I, I think you can see myself. Let's see. Yeah, if we do it like this, what do you see now? Do you see it, both of us? Yes, yeah, see both of you, both of us. So that's sort of better. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. So now we're good. So um, uh, how is it if we would start with? If you tell us a little bit, how how did you start on the on the path of of psychotherapy and, and psychosynthesis. What was the the turning point for you, so to say? What was inspiring? I don't know. Okay, so I've always found people really interesting, partly because I come from a sort of um, a large family where I had an interesting relationship with my mother. Um, my parents were quite um, different. They didn't have a sort of normal, straightforward life and I didn't have a normal straightforward upbringing, but it made me very interested in trying to understand how they worked and how relationships within the family worked. I remember one of my tutors said to me once, you know, lots of therapists go into becoming therapists because they try to understand their mothers. So I felt quite comforted by that. Um, but, well, I'm just another one of those, right? Um, so I started, I was very interested and I bought this book. I've got some notes here, which I'm just going to refer to so I don't forget what I was going to say every time. I bought a book called um, The 50 Minute Hour by um, a chap called Robert Linder, Linder when I was about 16. And um, I was fascinated by it. I found the whole concept of therapy really interesting. And I made a promise to myself that I would become UKCP, which is United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy registered at some point. My problem was that I had parents who thought I ought to be studying history at university. So I, you know, it was a battle. Psychology wasn't something that was supported. Anyway, it's fine. And I, I went and did history. I then worked in publishing. I, um, and worked in publishing and I started working voluntarily for something called the Marriage Guidance Council, which is relate. It's like relationship counseling, a charity um, here. And I was in my early twenties, mid twenties, I think. And I decided that was just, I was far too young really to have enough experience to be able to support people. So I got on with my life. I lived abroad for a while. I had babies. I uh, did more publishing work. I did freelance publishing work when I had my babies and um, came back and did an advanced diploma in integrative and humanistic counseling, which was Gestalt, person-centered and psychosynthesis. And a lady called Sally Sugg taught psychosynthesis. I don't know if any of you know her, but anyway, um, she was a, an inspiring lady. On this program, we had to have a student placement and I got that student placement at British Airways, which was um, fantastic for me, really. 
um, my boss at British Airways was a man called Brian Graham, who some of you might have heard of. And um, anyway, he nudged me to do the master's in psychosynthesis psychotherapy at the Psychosynthesis Trust, which is how I started working there and I enjoyed it, did supervision training there, then became you know, staff member in various ways, et cetera, et cetera, built up a private practice. Um, yeah, so that's really, and I, I do some workshops with Brian Graham still. Um, yeah, that's how I started in training. Wow, that, that, was, that was quite an, quite an experience, quite a, um, um, how do you call it, um, uh, quite a curvy road from, from the moment you, you got inspired uh, by it, you, you felt drawn to it, right? Uh, in in teenage years, and then how life brought you in different places and through different um, stages, and then to come back to it. So it was an early interest, but then it materialized years after. So I think it's very very interesting. I think many many of us can um, maybe relate to that and and understand, recognize that in our own lives. Mm. Mm. Uh, so how 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 important is psychosynthesis for you? So psychosynthesis has been very important, really. I think I've tried to, at some points, deny it, right? So deny the sort of spiritual aspect of life. But actually, in my early years, we I was brought up so um, where my father was working. It was with, within the confines of Westminster Abbey, so he was a headmaster at a school there. So he had to be sort of a lay preacher at the Abbey. So it's high Anglican church. My mother became a Catholic convert, right? And um, so I had an awful lot of religion going on in my house in terms of intellectual discussion and, and that sort of thing. Um, and also a lot of rebellion against it. So when um, Brian, you know, was trying to convince me to do psychosynthesis as a, as a master's, I remember having long discussions with him about, oh, you know, I didn't know what I think about religion. So it was not about religion, it's about spirituality. And, you know, it was, was um, educating me like that, really. And so it has really important, that aspect of it. And I have found that it's, I have found that challenging in aspects of my life. So sometimes when I've been in dark places, I think, really, am I getting in contact with, you know, a higher self when I'm in a really dark place? I don't know. So... Um, it is important. It has been important. I'm already I'm also at the moment talking to the trust about doing some other workshops there. So it's obviously important. Um, mm. I love the, I love the, what do I love about it? I love the way it, it incorporates so many things. I love the way that it, it, it has such um, a wonderful set of values. I love the way that the people who are doing it and working with it are really interested in the well-being and the, the the growth of the individuals that they work with. I think it's wonderful like that. I think it's lovely to always look at potential in clients and in people we come to meet. And I, I think I owe a lot of the style of my work to psychosynthesis. Hmm. It's uh, beautiful how you how you described how it's integrated as as part of your life and part part of part of who you are in a way. And um, that's very much how I also relate to it as, as being, uh, being more of a, of a lifestyle and having all of these values, uh, not only being a, a method of working with mm -hmm. clients or working with other therapists and, and supervision as, as you do. Mm -hmm. um, but in a way, it's much more than that. Um, yeah. It also includes the, the, the spiritual aspect or, yeah, at least the the transpersonal aspect of of life, which maybe in in different in different times we came in contact with, as you did with your parents. Mm. So mm. it's it's beautiful to see that. Mm. I um I want I want us to get into the into the main subject now, into the front line nineteen. Into front and, line. Yeah, and and that that uh, that uh, amazing work that uh, you people did over there. 
So can you tell us a little bit about it? Like how how does it work? What's the organization? What's the what's the thought behind it? And and how did it materialize? And, and uh... sure, okay. So I'm going to tell you a bit about how it started. It was started mm. by two ladies, a lady called Claire Goodwin Fee and a lady called Ellen Waldron. And the reason Claire, who was the sort of energy behind it to begin with wanted to do something for the NHS was because her father had been treated for an illness at King's London and had received such good and wonderful care from the NHS, as well as uh, herself. She herself had received very good care as had her family, that she wanted to give something back. And she basically had the idea that she, this would be about a three month project and that she would um, help 30 to 50 people. But she was an active Facebook user. So she put a notice up on Facebook, a posting up on Facebook asking for people to, if there was anybody who would help her. And now there are um, 1200 volunteers wow. and more than 50,000 hours of therapy have been offered to wow. service users. So that's, I mean, it's a huge growth. It started, I remember when I, I was first sort of introduced, I heard about this and I thought um, I was really interested in doing, I tried to make masks. You know, when we started with the pandemic, I don't know what it was like in Sweden, but we all went into sort of wartime mode here and people was like sewing masks and sewing sort of overalls and the rest of it. And I tried, my attempts at masks were disastrous. So I thought, oh, better do something. I can do better than that. So um, I, I contacted Ellen, in fact, and because I knew her through a friend and said I would work. And there was nothing at that point, no website. And then they built up, um, they had a very simple website to start with. And, um, and now they have, um, a, a, I don't know if you've seen it, a, a, a good website where they, yes. um, they, they, you know, put up um, clients for therapists to um, be allocated, etc. And it now is, it's good because they have a sort of triage system where they can um, assess the level of need of the client and allocate therapists very quickly. They have amazingly efficient allocation rate. There's a very good woman who's in charge of that now, but the need is phenomenal. So if I, when I finish working with a client and if I want to take another one, I have another one within 10 minutes. Hmm. So the need is phenomenal. I think the, um, the busiest month so far has been, I'm going to down like January this year, about 855 people wanting referrals. Wow. Mm. So, so how it works is that the, the clients are NHS personnel. So it's like doctors, nurses, um, other type of, of personnel working in the NHS. Uh, with the with the COVID um, uh, patients, okay, it's it's NHS personnel, and but it's also um, uh, the key workers, so the fire service, paramedics in the ambulances, um, people in care homes, um, you know, it's the people who are, are considered key workers. So it's slightly broader than the NHS. All right, so so it's healthcare in in general, so to say. And uh, how it works is that um, the therapists are are volunteers, yeah. So they don't they don't get paid for that, but but they contribute to the hours. Uh, and which each therapist, I would assume they they choose how many hours they want to allocate yeah. to to this activity, and then and and then they they get assigned a client uh, through the triage system. Indeed, and I think it's. Um really important if, if you know if you let, let's assume you want to set something up like this in Sweden for, for people to think about how much they want to take on right mm. and at the beginning because in a way my client numbers went down in terms of private clients during the first lockdown and so I felt I had more time and I think I took on four maybe five um, and then after a while, my, my client number started back up again. I dropped a couple, but actually it was good for me to drop because it's a lot of trauma. Mm. And I think it's really, really important to think about how much of that work you want to have in your 
a practice. And especially yeah. because it's it certainly felt like this in the UK that it's quite, it's very pressurized. I mean, uh, you know, it feels like, right, you get finished with one client, you've got another one coming. It feels like one's in a sort of war zone. Yeah. So, so that would be um, like a main difference that, that you noticed right away with, with these clients coming from, from this group that it, it's, it's way more trauma and, uh, and, and different, more heavy themes than the regular practice of clients that you had before. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of um, differences, actually. I mean, um, one of the things um, that, that inevitably happened was that I saw all clients online, right? So suddenly you're seeing into people's bedrooms, into people's dining rooms, into people's cars, into people's kitchens, people's walks, because they sometimes would walk, you know, and, and speak. So that was all very different. And that, that was with, um, you know, non, non-NHS clients as well. Yeah. Um, but I think it creates a very different sort of um, sense of what you're seeing with your clients because you can't, for example, I can't see all of your body. I can't see if your foot's waving furiously with irritation, right? But you can see it if somebody's sitting opposite you. Yeah. Um, but you're seeing so much other stuff. And, and then it's very, it's very easy to get distracted too, right? But, um, but anyway, so with the NHS, you were seeing that. And um, so that was one thing that was different. Um, people um, were often, NHS staff were often living in hostels or hotels so that they weren't going to infect or pass on any disease um, or infection to their loved ones. Hence, they were super isolated. Mm. So they would come out of hospital and maybe have their defenses working whilst they were in hospital, come home and they couldn't come home and throw their arms around their loved ones necessarily because, you know, I mean, it probably the same as Sweden. They had to strip off as soon as they got in the door, put everything in the washing machine and were on their own eating, sleeping often. Yeah. So actually, as a therapist, you were sometimes the only support they had partly because they chose not to, I notice a lot of my clients chose not to tell their families about what was happening at work because they didn't want to distress them. Yes. So, so there are different, there are different things that uh, it was like a dramatic change in their lifestyle and in how their lives looked all over. So, um, so that was that was a huge change that impacted not only having to deal with the pandemic but also deal with maybe loneliness and maybe isolation yeah. um, that maybe work on other other things that were maybe untouched. I'm just fantasizing here. I'm just imagining. I don't know if it was like that, but um, I don't know. That's that's what it 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 uh, throws me somewhere to. Maybe there is some, there was some unaddressed trauma that n- now got the opportunity to surface in a way. Was what in individually way? That, they, that they had had individually previously? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was, I think, one of the um, one of the things I noticed about doing this work. Well, one thing which I haven't said, which is important to say, was that they they were sort of allowed or the advice was that we gave them up to 12 sessions right so we had 12 sessions and um after that um they were if they wanted to continue they'd have to continue through another organization or they they could pay right um but one of the things is if there's unaddressed trauma and that got re re re-triggered right with the work that they were doing then it's how much of this time do you spend on which trauma and you know, bearing in mind that one has twelve weeks, and I think there were a lot, there was um, a lot of things. I had um, somebody who'd uh, wanted to be a um, had was a nurse, and she'd had a horrible accident um, many some years ago, about five years previously, and some of that trauma was re-triggered when she was um, had to go into ICU because she hadn't worked in that sort or, or acute ward because she hadn't been doing that. And it reminded her of her own trauma. So there's that. It's like weighing up, isn't there? What else you work with? 
what, what's impacting on the person that, that makes them not want to be at work or feel that they can't cope with work? So there are first some limitations that come in place in terms of how many sessions do they, do they get? Yeah. Um, and then there are also some limitations uh, for you as a therapist of, okay, how many clients coming from this area can I take care of during this period? Sure. Um, so what, what did you feel that was the, like the most effective or at hand um, tools that you have as a, as a therapist to, to approach that? or methods or yeah I don't know um I was gonna jump in here at me um let me just have a look I, um in terms of um tools I think was one of the most the most important thing was containment right just being able to listen and hear that's what I mean about um being um acutely aware of how much trauma you want to hear have in your practice right um so it was something about emergency holding, like the stages of it, you'd have like an emergency holding where you would contain the client, um, especially if they were in a, a real place of stress and overwhelm, which was about the most um, regular um, symptom. And um, then you'd, you'd, sort of, you'd, you'd listen to them, emergency holding, and then maintaining something about how they can cope with what they're experiencing and strategies for coping and then moving forward having got those strategies and thinking how they wanted to continue or, or if they wanted to continue and, and work going forward so it was different things at different times um the, you know one of the things that um the nhs people found quite stressful even though i think some of them very appreciated it was i don't know if you know but at, at six o'clock every thursday night we would stand on our doorsteps and clap for the NHS, right? And I yes. think we thought we were doing this to really, really support them. And I'm sure it did support a lot of them. And some of them found it a huge pressure because there was so much pressure on them to be angels, to be the healers, to be the ones that save lives. Mm -hmm. And they weren't able to do that always. And so, you know, they have to deal with that stuff as well, the sort of expectations of the public. Yes. Yes, that's that's a very interesting point because we we had it in in Stockholm at least as well. Um, it was um, it was also I don't remember if it was yeah maybe also six o'clock in the evening. Um, people will will open their windows and 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 clap for the healthcare workers. But I maybe I had a feeling of it in a way being a little bit too much for them. I don't know. Uh, I was trying to put myself in there, but I, I haven't thought of th that perspective of, of actually putting more pressure on, on someone who's already under a lot of pressure working with that and, and not being always successful and, and a lot of death rates and a lot of um, very dark period for, for everyone. So that's that's a very interesting point. Mm. And I think, you know, there's, I certainly found amongst the doctors that I spoke to, and one of the other things that's different about working during the pandemic, actually, was that I was speaking to people because it was online from all over the country. So I live in the Southeast, but suddenly, you know, I was having people from all of Glasgow, in Scotland, in Wales, and Northern England. So it was sort of culturally quite different, one. But also it was just like, um, it was just interesting for me in that way. But people had different experiences in, in different places, yeah. But um, what, one thing I did notice amongst the doctors particularly that I worked with was that they had a sort of perfectionism thing. Mm. So it's like, we're the doctors, we should be able to be strong. And there was um, a real sense of if, if we see a counsellor, like, are you, are you sure if this is confidential? Are you sure this is that and the other? Because actually people will think we're weak or we're not good at our jobs because we're the ones who should be able to cope and we're not coping in this way. And there's also uh, some fear amongst doctors too as to whether seeing a counsellor would 
put any restriction on their career prospects. Yeah. Wow. wow. But that was a fear, you know, and then we get into yeah. you know, when things are we're under pressure, right? We go into irrational fear. And so yeah. I don't think it's the truth. It's just a fear. But it's not something like a like a stigma or something that it's I don't know frowned upon uh, if it happens, right? It's not the general. It has to do with the pandemic fear. It's not a general thing that is happening in the UK that doctors are stigmatizing those who or their peers who go to a therapist and so on. Or well, you know, I don't know. I I, I haven't worked with many doctors, so it would be interesting <laughs> to know what you have in in Sweden. I mean, I I actually think it's we have changing attitude towards mental health here, and I think that's good. Um, yeah. However, if you're in a in a profession that people regard you as, you know, put you on a pedestal, it is hard to own fragility or f- feeling vulnerable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's that's also a very, a very, very important perspective to have in mind if um, we want to mobilize ourselves here in Sweden and 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 work with that target group. Because it's, I think it's, it's uh, quite a lot of truth in that um, that it's coming with. I don't know if there are any doctors among us tonight um, who are also psychosynthesis therapists, but um, I think it, it's a little bit like you say. It comes with the um, with the profession. It comes with the title. It comes with the with the uniform, so to say. That it's. Yeah. Yeah, fragility and and uh, vulnerability. It's not um, one of the things that uh, any doctor would just put on their chest and be proud of. Mm. Yeah, it's quite the opposite. You talking about uniforms is making me think also about um, the PPE, which is the the protection, the uh, the the masks and the all of the stuff that the um, clients were having to wear. So at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of stuff around there not being the proper equipment, right? The masks and the V visors and God knows what else. And then once there was the equipment there, people were getting um, sores. Uh, I know, you know, somebody who was in A&E was just getting terrible sores on their faces from um, the mask, you know, whatever it was being too tight or whatever. And also the fact that they found it difficult, communication became more difficult because of course no one can see your mouth, right? And mm. and you can't, if you can't see somebody's mouth, you can't really make sure you're hearing properly, as it were. There was a sense that I have heard, of, I did hear of people saying that, that they felt that their voices were muffled. Mm. And then the other thing is that because you're wearing all of this protective gear, what you are is a pair of eyes and a label saying, you know, staff nurse or, you know, J Smith staff nurse or whatever. But that's that's what the patient who may be dying, right, is or mm-hmm. seriously ill, is able to see, if indeed they are able to see, because often the patients are on their stomachs, right? So that was also very difficult. So there's been such a lot for um, health workers to cope with because they felt more remote from these patients, even though they were perhaps the closest people to them when they were dying or very sick or holding a phone so that the patients could hear their relatives say goodbye or, I mean, it's been Hmm. very, it gives a lot of protection that PPE from the virus, doesn't give you any protection from the emotional impact. We can let that one sink a little bit. Mm. Mm. So, what would uh, what what would be the the teachings? What would be the the lessons? Uh, what what did you feel that you learned both as a therapist and as a human being from from this experience and from helping these people who are exposed to so much trauma and suffering themselves in their own ways, even if they weren't sick with it directly? 
Um, yeah. One of the things that clients said again and again at the end of sessions or even at the beginning actually was how wonderful it had been to be heard. So as a therapist, I realized that, you know, it wasn't all about clever tricks or stuff, although I did, you know, there were some obviously tools which I'll talk about um, that one uses, but actually just to be heard, to be listened to, to hear how awful it was, to hear um, how, and to bring in actually the important, the other thing is to, it, it made me realize how much we don't talk about death in the UK. I mean, you might talk about it more in Sweden, death and dying, but we tend to avoid it, right? And I, you know, I've noticed this with my own circumstances, but um, I really realized how important it was to be able to facilitate those people saying, actually, I'm scared, or I'm scared for my mum, or I'm scared for my family. I'm scared of people dying. Actually, I'm scared of death and be able to listen and be okay with that. I mean, I don't know what it's like for you in Sweden as therapists, whether you're, you're, you're better at um, doing this than perhaps we are, but it's something increasingly I notice in my work and it's something I, I thought um, very much about when I was working with these clients because actually there was so much death you couldn't avoid it, right? And it wasn't yes. predictable. The other thing is about this disease is it wasn't predictable at the beginning anyway. I don't know if it is now, but these people, you know, have gone into a profession where they're there to help, to try and maintain life, to try and make people better. And I think sometimes the medical model is, okay, if this doesn't work, we'll try this. And if this doesn't work, we'll try this. And, you know, at some point they get to an answer or a way forward with treatment. Whereas I think this was so unpredictable, it, it, throws, it throws people. Hmm. Yes. It's, I don't, I cannot answer for, for my colleagues. And I, I, we definitely have, I know that we have colleagues who, who started groups for cancer, um, terminally ill uh, patients, and and other um, other groups that are are more near their own death. Uh, so I think that there it's more existential themes are, are coming up. And but I, my own experience is that these existential themes come in occasionally. Uh, in regular therapy and it's and it's not like the the main drive mm. um, that is very present and I would assume that for the vast majority of of, uh, of clients um, in our in our group or in our layer of society is is pretty much like that except those who are um, as said ill or working with um, with yeah, working with this from, from the healthcare perspective. Mm. I can I just say a bit more about the sort of um, like tools and things, because that might be useful. Please, yeah. please, please. It's, it's, um, it, I, I even wanted to ask you how, how, how we could, what, what could we learn if we want to start that? How, how, what kind of tools and what, what kind of things can we, can we take advantage of? Yeah, so, I mean, as I say, I think sort of offering that containment and being able to contain the trauma. One of the things I thought was, uh, it, it really needs to be okay with talking about death and dying, um, psychoeducation, right? So for some people, for many of these um, health workers, this was their first experience of therapy. So they needed to understand really a bit more about the sort of fight, flight, freeze response about, um, you know, some people talk about um, dissociating, so they, they'd have their defense, they wouldn't call it dissociating, of course, but something about, um, you know, um, I just shut down and, um, you know, this can't be normal. But it's like the cre it's like looking at how that is a creative thing to do when you've got too much to cope with, right? So there was some, a lot of um, psychoeducation talking about the importance of healthy eating and exercise. Um, and one of the things that um, clients 
complained about was not getting support within the NHS. And I'm not, I don't think there's anyone to blame for this. I think it's just that they were not the resource. So you would have somebody who, for example, I had a, um, a nurse who was working in a, an acute uh, COVID ward. She was the only person there, two dying patients, no doctors available and other patients as well. And she said to her matron or whoever it was when she eventually saw her, you know, um, I just like, I'm just, you know, exhausted. And everything. we're all exhausted. So, and they were all exhausted, you know, there just wasn't the support there. So um, they will use, have needed their defenses really in order to be able to cope. So it's about not dismantling the defenses, but without, sometimes a reaction to not getting support from an organization that you're working for can be that you say to yourself well I won't look after myself either right I'll come home and drink two bottles of wine that's what I'll do you know and, and but that can be a sort of you know if you're not feeling looked after then maybe we sometimes don't look after ourselves. and I think that's really important to be aware of um normalizing their experiences so that, because um, that takes away the sort of self-talk of I'm not good enough. So if they're saying, oh God, you know, I just feel dreadful because of X, Y, and Z, well, you know, this is a normal response in this situation. Yeah. Um, what else? I Looking at what other factors might be impacting. So we talked a bit about previous trauma, but things like relational or familial um, challenges and when I was going when just going back to the pressure of especially of the doctors people being doctors a lot of the female doctors I spoke to up uh, who were from other towns further north from me were often from ethnic minorities the expectations of their families for them to be super women was very strong right they had that to deal with as well um the I would use guided meditation sometimes. So you know some of Ferrucci's meditations, especially things like the Temple of Silence, or you know those those sorts of meditations were lovely for some clients. They they loved being taken away on a just a, into a different space, and that that worked well. Disidentification also, so that you know. I'm a doctor, I am more than a doctor, I'm a nurse, I'm more than a nurse, and looking at what other um, what other aspects of their, their, their identity that they had. Um, about how to manage anxiety, so, for, you know, doing breathing exercises, doing sort of allocation of anxiety, because sometimes people would be anxious about other things, so they couldn't say, well, I'm anxious about work, or they'd be anxious about the fact, I don't know, that their partner might not ring them. So it's like almost allocating space for that. Like how about giving 15 minutes to being anxious and just be anxious, be seriously anxious for that 15 minutes and then leave it. And that sort of compartmentalizing it like that, that's quite useful. Scaling, so like at uh, the beginning, first session asking people out of 10, how they felt in terms of anxiety or depression or whatever it was that they were, sense of overwhelm, whatever they were coming with. And then, asking them how they were the next time and what it took to get from A to B, what it would take to get from B to C, that sort of thing was um, useful. Um, um, yeah, I sort of also think that, um, that those who join the caring um, professions, we can often carry an unspoken message of, I want to be cared for. And if we don't get that care, we can get angry. Um, I noticed some, some clients were hugely angry with the public. So if they saw people without masks or people who were not socially distancing, they would feel angry. Right, I could understand their anger, right? Um, and encouraging self-care, really important. I mean, I should mention the healthy eating and stuff, but I also think that, you know, I remember one person came, you know, I was gonna give up chocolate this month. And I thought, why? Why would you give up chocolate this month when actually it's a crap month for you to give up chocolate and, you know, really do it when the pandemic's over? You know, I'm being flippant, but you know what I mean? People were trying to be harsh with themselves at a time when they needed to be comforted, yeah. And also to, I think, important as a, as a therapist for me to have recognised when somebody else needed more support than I could offer, i.e. they needed psychiatric support. And at Frontline, they now have 
you know, a psychiatric referral if you if you need one. So if you're going to set something up like this up in Sweden, I, I would imagine that that was a really important thing to do too. Hmm. Yeah. Does that answer some of your questions? <laughs> all, all of them. <laughs> No, but it's, that's wonderful. I think it's very inspiring, uh, at least for me, um, and I assume for my colleagues as well, um, to to hear this firsthand, hands-on experience from you. Um, and I think it gives us um, it gives us a little bit a little bit more of a picture of uh, maybe how it would look like if we would start something like this uh, here in Sweden uh, now. We cannot. Um, I don't think we can ask the, the the practical things there, but I, but I think we we understood the the volunteer basis and and the, the drive uh, that's behind this organization frontline, uh, and I think that's uh, that's very important to identify with us here. If if we can find the drive and we can find that that type of mobilization within uh, our circles and, and maybe just uh, expand that to um, even psychiatric help or even other forms of therapy uh, which are present here in Sweden. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I thought it might be interesting. I, I think I mentioned this to you earlier, Mircha, that perhaps if people sort of, I don't know, in twos or threes could think about how they may be, what may be similar, what may be different. Mm -hmm. Um, for you if you were going to establish this sort of um, organization in Sweden and then maybe any questions arise from there we can look at those would that be a good idea or are there questions yeah. Yeah? yeah maybe maybe we should do that now so I think if Michael will help us with um, with dividing everyone into I, groups of three. I have eight, eight eight breakout rooms with three or four participants all right. How, so how long? How long, how, how long and the question again? So the, the question, question would be: How may? How may? What may be the differences and similarities to offering the same sort of support in Sweden as we do in the UK? Okay. So it's just differences a, and similarities. Yes. Yeah. So how, how long? long do you think you would would like? Ten is ten minutes enough, or would you want a bit more? Ten, to, ten, 10 minutes, I would say it would be good. Let's I do guess. that then. Let's do 10 minutes. Okay. And come back with questions and we can have a discussion. Yeah. All right. Do, do we have uh, anyone, has anyone written anything already? I see nothing in the chat whatsoever. Nothing in the chat. Sure. Um, no, should, we, should we take people, maybe. People, I think people are shy to write. Okay, <laughs> but but they're probably not shy to speak. So should should we take uh, maybe a short question or or an observation or something? Uh, someone had a brilliant idea uh, during this breakout rooms, and um, and maybe you should take that and 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 discuss it and comment on it. Anyone who feels um, ready. Well, I I can say something. My name is Elizabeth, and uh, it's lovely to listen to you, Shoban. Thank you for for letting us know something about how it's for you over there. But what we were talking about actually was that uh, well, the system in Sweden is a bit different than in England, and we as psychosynthesis therapists uh, do not have access to 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 the healthcare system the way that you have maybe in in the uk so since our education in and our training in sweden is not an academic one we are not uh, allowed into that system um, so uh, what about what about in the uk was there did you have was there some um, qualification that you would need to have to, to be allowed into the system and to work with this as a volunteer group. Okay, so um, I don't think so, because I think we're working for frontline rather than for the NHS. So um, I, I don't, I don't know, I wasn't screened, but then she knew me because I'd been a tutor somewhere, right? So 
Um, but I, I think there needs to be screening. I think at the beginning, there are lots of volunteers, and I think they were from all types of modalities. Certainly, I don't think psychosynthesis is rated here within the NHS, right? They do CBT or IAPT and all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and But it was certainly not a limiting factor to being a volunteer because you were volunteering and you were offering a therapeutic space to support people. So we weren't working for the NHS, we were working for Frontline who was supporting the NHS. Might be a little different. Now maybe, maybe that actually is something, if you're going to start something in Sweden, you're, you're not, you don't actually have to be employed by the health sort of um, authority. I don't know how it works here, but um, that you, you form your own organization to offer support to those people who might need it. Yes, it, it sounds it sounds quite similar to to Sweden, and then quite possible for us uh, from from that perspective. I would assume because if if we establish an or, if we establish an organization similar to Frontline, and uh, then we open up for uh, for giving support to clients. Well, these clients are, are coming from the healthcare system, but we are therapists, which we don't have to be part of the system and we don't have to be part of the academia, but we're creating yeah. that space, as you say. So in that sense, it's quite similar. Yeah, and I think that's definitely what's happened. I mean, I wasn't aware of anybody saying, well, what modality are you or what, mo you know? So I think it's like you're offering your time. It was it was a time when people needed people to be volunteering and, and it was accepted. It would be a shame if you were not able to do that because of some prejudice against you know, a spiritual modality or something. Mm -hmm. Question from Isabel Lahermelin. Uh, I would like, because we, we have had quite a, a far initiative through the uh, Psychosynthesisföreningen with this uh, ed education in crisis and trauma and uh, and I, I didn't follow it all the way to the end. So I would like, I don't know if Anne or Annika or some of you, or Monica, that some of you were in this, in this group as well, in this training, Christ and Trauma. So I just wonder what happened with it and why, because that was such a great initiative, just what we are talking about today. So why didn't we get to the very end? Why didn't we start to, to give this, uh, sessions or the support if any one of you have any answer for that Anna seems to be eager to, uh, to answer a question again well we started the work and we had the workshop as you said with crisis and trauma uh, but we wasn't really sure how we should approach because we didn't want to uh, the system already had uh, coaches and some uh, were already in the system. So by offering free uh, therape therapeutic uh, sessions, we were we wasn't really sure whether we were working against our own members or we were supporting our community because we are we are working in different different areas. So so we we just left it with that everybody was a, was free to offer a free therapy if they wanted to, and we also made a leaflet that you could print out and and um, use. So so that's how far we came, but there was a split because we didn't know whether those who already have started organizing themselves within the system if we were kind of creating a competition within our own association. So that's the reason. So we kind of left it up to each member how to proceed. And I think that's why we are here tonight because we wanna to know how we can proceed and if there's any other ways that we can kind of cooperate instead of uh, making competition. So that is also another question that I'm wondering, how long do you think that this group for front lines will continue? Have you some kind of limit if the pandemic starts to decrease? Will it continue in another form or how do you think it will? 
So I'm not one of the people who developed it, but no. um, what, what I, I, I think is happening is that they're trying to get funding now so that the support can continue um, post pandemic. I, I don't know that for definite, but that's what I, I, my, I'm surmising. When I spoke to Ellen, when I knew I was going to be speaking with you, I spoke to one of the organizers and just said, you know, what's it, you know, where are you at with all of this? And she said, it's nowhere near over, you know, the effects of the pandemic. And I was just mentioning to Mircha that actually what's happening now is that people are getting post-traumatic stress because they've coped with, with it all and then are just like starting to come out, well, we hope, and then, you know, having that post-traumatic stuff. So this could go on for ages. How long people are going to be willing to volunteer for, I think is another matter. Um, I think people have been very open-hearted and it sounds like, you know, you all wanting to do something, uh, wanting to volunteer, whether the reality will be that that continues with people volunteering or whether they would like to, some uh, remuneration. I don't know, I don't know. I said, no, so I, I think I said at the beginning, you know, I was seeing five people, I think. I'm seeing two now because I also have a quite a full client load. And, you know, in the end, I'm, you know, it's how I earn my living. So it's about balancing the volunteering I do with um, the, the, the money I need to make to make a living. Exactly, yeah. So I think that is also one of the discussions that we have had then. We are not so many members yet. So what will happen if we have more clients then we can offer help that we will not be so many members who can take care of all these needs that is. Would you consider sort of being like open to like working with other, you know, uh, models with other organizations and different models so that you were doing it? I mean, this would, this seems to be what uh, the front line seems to incorporate lots of different models and people just coming from anywhere. So, you know, I don't know if that would be something that would work there in Sweden or for you or not. I don't know either, but I like the idea. So I think we should look into that because that would be very good if we could kind of share this together, the responsibility. Mm. I also think that it will take a long time before the need will disappear i think there would be a new need now yeah and, and the, the the ladies who started this when i when i did speak to them they said they'd be very happy to talk to you about st setting something up um mm -hmm. you know um if, if it would support you so i will give Mircha the information and um you can contact yeah you... that would be nice yes Really? Yeah, that, that would be great. And and uh, I, I agree very much with your suggestion as well to include other forms of therapy. And uh, in, in Sweden, there are other models and other forms that are not really part of the part of the system. Um, I don't know, like Gestalt or existential or different types, which we as a, as a branch of psychology, we also have kind of good relations as I as I see it uh, with with the other types of uh, therapies and uh, I think it would be interesting just to just to open that up and I think it will help a lot both the 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 branch of, of psychology which is psychosynthesis to become even more um, well known and available and recognized um, like it would, like it, I would assume happened with Frontline. Uh, that was a little bit of an opening um, towards the authorities or towards the the state to to actually see and approve and and um, appreciate the help that is given to the healthcare workers. And in that sense, in a way, recognize the the form of therapy because right now. I my understanding is that we are a little bit in a gray zone. We're not really totally outside, but we're not totally we're not in the the academia or the the healthcare system, uh, which is a pity. Many other countries have uh, recognized uh, psychosynthesis and included that in in different areas of uh, public service, but not in Sweden. So I think there will be a, a way for us to just make some space and. 
and 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 show ourselves and what we're doing. Mm-hmm. It's like reaching out to the community too, isn't it? If you're doing it from you know and, and making an impact on the on the community wherever you are. Mm. I have another question, and that is um, yeah. about uh, supervision. How uh, do you... uh, ex- ex- excuse me? I think Sorry. Isabella. She was. Yeah. She was in to... before. Yes, I just want to comment, or if I don't remember wrong, because in this work group through the, the Psychosynthesis Psychosynthesis Association, wasn't it so that some members who were already in the healthcare system started to ask ask their colleagues how the need were. And the answers they got was that the, the healthcare system managed by themselves a lot, that they had their own uh, uh, counseling and their own support system within the healthcare. And do you remember if? Uh, yes, I, since I'm a healthcare worker as well, so I'm in both places, uh, there is, a, there is a offered, all the healthcare uh, system is offered coaching and supervision during this time but i'm not sure if it if the system will cope with it for a longer time because at the at the beginning it was for just acute uh, uh, supervision and now i think we have a, a very different need in the healthcare system so so i think as uh, Shiwan said, that perhaps just going on Facebook would be an alternative for those who has been working for a very long time and wants to have, go to therapy for a, for a longer period, for 12 sessions. Because we only spoke about three sessions, and I think that's a very short uh, term, and I'm not sure whether it will be enough or not. I think 12 sessions sounds more like you kind of can wrap it up a little bit before the client has to move on and decide whether the client will go further or just finish after 12 sessions. So it's also a responsibility for our community or our association. And it's not just a light responsibility of three sessions. I think it is more. And then we will probably have to agree about how many clients can we take. Um, and it, perhaps it will be different from each therapist. So I think we could continue discussing this afterwards also. Mm-hmm. Anne, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just putting on my police hat here. So you had a question. Yeah. I was wondering, how do you take care of the therapists? Do you, do you, as a therapist, have to provide your own supervision and pay for it through your clients that you get paid for? Or how do you do it when you voluntarily work with healthcare? So, so this has evolved, obviously, because the, um, because the organization has evolved. So I, I have my own supervision for my own work anyway, and I tend to take my NHS clients there if I need to. Um, they are now offering supervision. So I guess some people are offering um, supervision, volunteers are doing that. So it's something that has mm-hmm. developed. I think initially that wasn't the case, but now they are doing that. So as the organization develops, these things come into play. I mean, I think that's the other thing which is probably quite important to think about is that you can't necessarily provide everything all at once. So mm-hmm. it's like starting and gradually building it up because if you think about trying to create the whole organization within a week, it's just not going to be feasible, right? Just have to build it up, yeah. Mm. So do I think, or at least that's my experience from also being an oncology nurse and being in England, that you have a lot more uh, practice with volunteering work that we don't have here in Sweden. And it also sounds like you have a tradition that it is easier to see that if we offer this kind of help, therapeutic help for the healthcare system, then we can also offer voluntarily supervision and so it goes in, in in more rings than just one ring and I think it's a lovely system and that is probably something that 
I think Sweden also will have to adapt somehow because the system here in Sweden cannot provide all this that we thought from the beginning that we were able to do through the healthcare system. Mm. Mm. So I also think it's a way of changing a long tradition and perhaps it's the right time now with the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. There's new needs. Mm. Sign for potential yeah. growth, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Something in there. May I... <laughs> May I ask a totally different question? Come, on from, come in from a different angle and, and ask you, what do you think that psychosynthesis brought to the table that that you know other schools didn't do or or what is more what what could be more psychosynthesis specific in this kind of work as you as you've experienced it yeah so i think um one of the things that has been really important working with these clients is talking about meaning and purpose which I think it's very psychosynthesis. I think it's um, looking at um, what this what this pandemic has meant for them, what their experience in the pandemic has meant for them, how they understand their lives and their ways going forward. It's also, I think, about unlocking their potential for development and growth, and and seeing so. I was always, I always hold my focal vision with clients, obviously, as I'm sure you will do. So you're seeing them as they are within their mm. psychodynamic setup and all the rest of it. And then you're seeing their potential for growth and, and how they bring meaning into their lives. And I think that's been, that's been really important in some of the conversations I've had with people, just to remind them almost. I think it can be that people un under this sort of crisis situation can lose their contact with meaning and lose their contact mm. with having purpose because you're surviving. And then, you know, when you, at some point you sort of think, well, hold on, where am I in this? What does it all mean? Mm. What do I think about my life? What purpose do I have? Is there something greater? All of these questions, which I think psychosynthesis can, can offer, you know, it, it offers that other dimension, that other perspective, which gives people the opportunity to explore that. Mm -hmm. There are like when we had we had a chat we had a chat excuse me Misha. we had a chat before and I, I think you also mi uh, mentioned uh, the distant identification exercise. I did. Could you elaborate? Could you elaborate a bit on that? Do you know the one I mean? It's like I am I am a body. I am you know I my body does this that and the other and I'm more than my body, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So I think that became really important. Um, to use when people were over-identified with being a nurse or over-identified with being a doctor in this situation, which they sort of have to be in the hospital, right? And then coming out could not let go, right? So coming out could not actually just be somebody's friend or mum or something or, or a person who plays tennis, or I don't know, but it doesn't matter what, what else they would be. But so it would help for them to be able to step back. And that's something else I think we do really well in psychosynthesis is that you can step back from um, being over-identified. And if we're over-identified, we can become much more anxious in this sort of crisis situation. So if we're able to step back more, the anxiety lessens. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Has it answered your question, Michael? Most definitely, thank you. It made sense. <laughs> I um, I just wanted to uh, to continue on, on that path because we're um, uh, we, we're going into into this uh, most existential and most uh, survival mode, and also identification and disidentification from it. Uh, and there I want to bring into discussion the the other um, activity that you also do and and uh, in a way I think you have all the right to be proud of uh, and which is the the widow group um, and if you would want to to develop a little bit to, to say a few words about that certainly so what you probably need to know first is that I don't run it I didn't start it 
well, I did sort of start it, but I started it because I was, a, I was widowed um, five and a half years ago. And the person who did my hygienist at the dentist, right, said to me, um, I, she was widowed two and a half years previously. She literally picked me up from on the floor, being on the floor. And um, she knew a couple of other people about our age. And I, I, I sort of think we're young, you know, but I'm 64 now. I was 58 at the time. I still think I'm young, right? Whatever, deluded. <laughs> um, but so we, um, we started meeting and it was lovely to be able to meet with people who knew what I'd been through and, or what I was going through. And one of the things I realized as a therapist was how incredibly inane and not, I can hear something, what's that? Not okay. Um, some of my interventions had been with clients who had been bereaved previously, right? And I realized that unintentionally with friends and clients, I had made sort of rather banal um, comments and interventions. So actually to be with other, these other three ladies who had been widowed sort of within sort of the previous five years and, and uh, two of them the same year as myself, be able to sort of go through that with them and feel much less alone. And sort of slightly bizarrely, more and more people, and sadly, more and more people joined so that they got to hear about, or they heard that some of us were meeting and they joined and it became bigger and bigger. I mean, tragically, because people were losing their partners too young. And so it got so big that we actually, and, and COVID sort of happened, that we started to divide, that's when I did become sort of a bit more proactive in it, to divide it into groups of smaller groups of, of people so that we were, they were A, allowed to meet. And then when we weren't allowed to meet in groups of six anymore, they were able to meet on Zoom, et cetera. It has been, um, for me, it was the most amazingly supportive thing. And for the people who have come into it, even people who've been widowed longer, they were so pleased to find people with whom they could still talk. So I think a lot of people in the UK, and I really don't know how it is in um, Sweden, one of the difficulties is that when you're, well, the status quo is that you are part of a couple, right? And so when you lose your partner, um, you lose somehow that sense of belonging within groups of being one of a couple. And, a lot of people find it very hard, you know, people would still invite you to Christmas parties or to whatever you were doing, but they, you, you'd be the sort of token sort of widow and people would feel sorry for you and you'd have a new identity and it was shit really. Um, so actually it was lovely to be with other people, to be able to hear them express all sorts of feelings, to realize that there's no real timetable to grief um, that it takes all sorts of different forms to realize that some people just need to come and sit and cry and in silence, but just be with you when they sit and cry, when other people could be laughing and it's okay. It's, um, you know, to help people understand that when people are saying things such as, I don't know, oh, all you have to do is to get through the first year of anniversaries and then you'll feel much better. <laughs> you know, I mean, pe people do it because in England, I don't know how it is in Sweden, but people are so uncomfortable, as I said before, with death in a way, that they, you know, they want you to say, you're all right. So I used to have said a lot to me, Siobhan, you're so strong. And I used to say, what option do I have, right? I either stop, right, or I'm strong, right? That's the deal. It's not as it's a huge life, life choices here. So, um, and I think that, yeah, I think people here anyway, they do find it difficult. And they really want to know that you're all right. So it's really good to have a group or a series of groups so people can go and they can be all right if they want. They can be not all right. They could have had a bad relationship. They could be having new relationships and feeling guilty. They could be worried about being judged. They could be wondering whether to take their wedding ring off. All of these things at different times. When shall I throw the clothes away? All of this sort of stuff, which they can talk with other people in a similar situation. And we do have widowers as well as. Um, widows um so you know that there is a sort of male representation there um mm -hmm. if, if i think now i think if people were going to be running somebody would wanted to start running that in 
in Sweden, I think I think this it's honestly people have been ringing from all over saying, can they come? I think there just isn't that um, facility here very much. But I think probably it needs to be somebody who's who's widowed because I think otherwise you'd be the only one who wasn't, and that would all be a bit weird. Um, yeah. Does that tell you a bit about it? Um, we meet, oh, as I tell you a bit about when we meet. So people have been meeting on Zoom every week. Um, when we weren't meeting on Zoom, um, people would be meeting in the pub, but we had like a, a chain pub where they had, um, they gave us coffee mornings and, and then one Friday a month, et cetera. And now in our own group, so I'm in a group with some other ladies who have been widowed for quite a long time. And some of us have been thinking about getting new partners and new lives and some of them us aren't wanting to do this some of them getting rid of their homes for the first time or all of this sort of thing and then there are groups right at the beginning where I am involved because they're the newer people coming in to just be there with that rawness of initial grief as there often is um, and then to be able to like guide them into other groups so that they get the support from the other groups or start running their own groups. So that's basically how it's working now. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, really. Um, so it's, you both gave us your own experience, but also a little bit of tips on, on how, how can something like this be started here and also how it, how it is managed. And it's interesting to, to hear, uh, especially that you're involved with new groups. So you didn't stick only to the, to the first one, but, but you, you opened up for, for new groups to be formed. Um, what I want to ask is, uh, is there any, as a therapist, do, do you have any responsibility of holding the group process or, or doing some sort of therapeutic work with the participants? Um, is it paid? Uh, is it, how is it organized? It is just like um, very democratic, very, I don't know. So I think because, because I was a widow at the first, so I, I went in there sort of raw and, you know, bleeding type of thing. And um, so I didn't have any therapeutic role. There was no way I could be therapeutic to anybody else at that point. Right? <laughs> so um, I, I, I sort of um, was just part of it. Yeah. And I think yeah. the whole group has been like that, except for now when we've divided them up into smaller groups where I'm starting with the newer groups with one other person so that we support the newer group, the newer group members in that initial supportive phase where they might need to repeat their stories again and again, or rage or somebody, you know, and, and pe people are able to say things like, um, you know, um, oh, I, I, if, I, if I still feel like this in two years time, I'm going to kill myself. And, and no one will bat an eyelid because it's okay. That's how they feel, right? It's okay. And I think you, you're able to hold that and, and then, those people will, after a few months, uh, maybe a bit more, they will be able to have their own group. Do you see know what I mean? So it's like an initial thing. And, and I suppose the therapeutic thing that I've been doing in, in that initial group thing now is to make sure people are sort of stable. Um, and because otherwise I think I would suggest that they got sort of more therapeutic support. It's basically a mutually supportive group with no one being the therapist really. It's just because we've now, had to divide, subdivide, and it's become so big that there has to be some sort of therapeutic look, I guess, at this stage. And I think it's hard not to be a therapist when you're a therapist, right? When I'm with my own group, we can sort of giggle about things and be completely non-therapeutic. And when, when I'm in a new group, it needs to be therapeutic, really. Yeah. Good, good points, good points. And, and very, yeah, anchored in reality because, because it is like that. Um, I, I wouldn't imagine it uh, any any other way if you're a participant than if you have a little bit more responsibility of leading the group. But uh, it's it's wonderful what uh, the power of the group uh, can do and, and how, how important that is. It's been hugely important. And one thing I hear so many times from the, the individual members, they say, oh, Siobhan, I'm so glad you introduced me to this group or whatever, because it's just been so marvelous. And especially over lockdown, right? We've had this horrible year when they've been on their own, suddenly on their own. And the thing about being widowed at 50 or 60 or whatever, is that you've 
spent a lot of time with your partner maybe and you've been sort of thinking well you know if you've had children the kids are off your hands you're looking forward to retirement looking forward to giving up work and suddenly you haven't got that and then you also you are suddenly on your own and especially if your children have grown up and you were in lockdown and you were absolutely on your own so it was incredibly important during that period I mean I think it still will be anyway because people have enjoyed it and they seem to have a good time but um, I think it has been I know it has been very um, supportive and important for those individuals. I want to ask you, Siobhan, if uh, would you like to to open up some breakout rooms for some discussion around the subject or? Well, I was going to the moment we talked about my blog. So if I just like say that a, a bit about it, because one of the things I want about that first, because uh, that, that was the, the next question. If uh, if you want to talk a little bit about that, because I am personally very curious and I assume that my colleagues are also curious about it. <laughs> Please, tell us. right? No, <laughs> so, so the blog for me, and I, I wanted to, to have some breakout rooms. So just talk about um, to get you to think about your own blocks to creativity, right? So the blog for me is an absolute delight in that I feel I can lose myself in it. I be, I'm one of those people who um, had always wanted to write the great novel, right? So I had this fantasy that one day, you know, I'd be there on the bestseller list and all this crap, but. Um, I actually, you know, I haven't been. I have started about five and I went on a, on a writing course. I don't know, was it two Novembers ago and realized that actually I quite liked writing funny things rather than the serious, dramatic, intense stuff I was trying to write. Um, so I did. And also I I kept reading sort of the therapy magazine that we get here, the BACP one. I thought, oh, God, it's also heavy. You know, you never felt lighter having read it. You didn't think, oh, that was a good read. That was fun. Um, and I thought, well, I asked, I met the editor who was a psychosynthesis guy, actually, of the private practice magazine, a guy called John Daniels. And I said to him, do you know, John, have you ever thought of doing something like light in here? So we have something funny or whatever. And he said, Siobhan, if you can do that, just like send me some, you know, pieces of work. So I decided to create the imperfect therapist. Of course, it's not me at all, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, um, an exaggerated you're version perfect, of a bad right? me. <laughs> exaggerated version of a bad me, but anyway. Um, but I wanted to make it humorous. I wanted to make people feel that they didn't have to be perfect. And I wanted to make some serious points as well. When I was younger, fiction was like super important to me. And in my master's, actually, my dissertation was all about our relationship with fiction and what we can project onto characters. And I use it in my work. Um, so um, I had this favorite book called Rebecca. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's a Daphne du Maurier book. It's all sort of, you know, intense, passionate, down, set down in Cornwall um, with strong love and dead ex-wives and murdered people and stuff. Anyway, it's all quite good. And I loved this when I was a child. It really sort of appealed to my sort of dramatic <laughs> sense of, I don't know, whatever. And then when I was doing my training in Psychosynthesis Trust, I realized that all of the characters were aspects of me or, you know, I was projecting or I could use it. And I thought, oh, right, okay, well, that's yeah, all right, the ideal father, okay. Mm -hmm. But so it was very interesting to think about that. And anyway, so in my blog, I have two inner critics. It's my, well, no, not myself, it's Lizzie and her two inner critics. And her inner critics, one of them is Mrs. Danvers, who's a character from this, um, novel Rebecca she's the wicked housekeeper who um, tries to make the the new wife's life hell and the other is called Boris who's a very old school friend of mine who's absolutely lovely and who was always gently sort of nudging me in one direction or another so I have them as as inner critics and then Lizzie making the mistakes or um, trying to cope with something that isn't quite straightforward in therapy and various things like I mean I've put in one of them a don't know if you've seen it, but there was one time when I had someone come to the door, you know, new session, and I thought, fine, and I sat them down, and as soon as they sat down, they said, um, you know, I, I, I need to ask you a question. I said, yeah, yeah, no, go ahead, before we start, it's fine, before they start the assessment. They said, oh, we, I know you're seeing X um, as a client. I need to ask you a question about um, him, and I said, um, uh, no, that's not, no, I have no contract with this woman at all, not possible. And I had to like see her out of the house, right? I had to like get her out of the house. But the irony was 
that I knew the question, I thought I knew the question she wanted to ask. I knew the question she wanted to ask was, does he love me or does he love his wife, right? And actually, as a woman, right, if I hadn't been a therapist, I think I would have sat her down and said, get out of that relationship, right? It's no good for you at all. He's still in love with his wife. Don't bother. But I couldn't, you know, it was like a completely confusing scenario. Anyway, I used that in one of the... Um, in the blogs, as just a sort of you know something as something can happen. I made lots of adaptations, but um, that was that was like um, a story that I wrote based on something that had actually happened. Yeah, which is you know we we all have these situations, don't we, which rather sort of surprise us in therapy. Mm. So what I wanted, yeah, well, the thing I thought about breakout groups was whether you you know you use creativity or you enable you were able to sort of use your creativity well yourselves or whether you had blocks to creativity and um and if you had blocks what might they be or how might you overcome the obstacle or bless it and overcome it in psychosynthesis terms <laughs> all right so uh, michael would you help us please with the breakout rooms and if you can please right. leave me and Siobhan uh, here in in this uh, main room. Uh, the, it doesn't it doesn't say that, but okay. You but don't, you can leave don't, and don't come sign back. in. Yeah. All the others, you are now transported by magic to breakout rooms. For <laughs> how is it? Ten minutes. Yeah. What do you say? Yeah. Ten minutes. Ma by magic. Can I ask a question while we're waiting? Do I'd love to hear from you. What's the name of the, your blog? It's the Imperfect Therapist. Okay. So Mircea will have um, the link, but it's the Imperfect Thera Therapist. Okay. Thank you. Because none of us is perfect. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So is everybody back? Because or, or is everybody yes. back? So what I'd really like is to hear from you guys about your own, you know, whether you do have blocks to your own creativity or whether you, you do something at the moment that really, I don't know, enhances your life in a way that is nothing to do with your own work or whatever. You need to speak so I can hear, right? <laughs> Good question. I, I can just, sorry I speak so much, but I just want to say that this is what every English teacher in Sweden has to face, these few minutes of silence with Swedish people, that it takes so <laughs> long time before we start to speak. So That's I just fine. want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and what about your creativity, Isabella? What does that mean? It means like that I leave for someone else to speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, then I can speak. Right. Um, my, my creativity is very alive and has always been. And um, I do all kinds of art, artistic painting and, and sculpturing and 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 uh, I really realized when I started to um, to do this uh, uh, how do you say uh, uh, education for becoming a um, psychosynthesis uh, counselor, I realized that the counseling is as creative, <laughs> but in a totally different way mm -hmm. to work with people in therapy also needs my creativity to to be <laughs> what the therapy i give mm. so i really feel that i can use that intuition that not knowing thing that that feeling of doing or saying things that i have no plan for for the same way i do in my studio and the same way i do in my in my therapy room it's sort of listening to something inside of me that i don't always know mm. like the intuition mm. it's it's in creating art it's in a way the same mechanism mm. 
like a sort of an, a, an energy you can't quite describe coming from somewhere you don't quite know where. And, uh, and always not knowing why. Or why. <laughs> always not knowing why, actually. Yeah. 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 Maybe it sounds scary, but <laughs> it works. But it doesn't sound Perfect. scary in a way, does it? Because in a way that is so psychosynthesis, isn't it? It's like we, we find a way of sort of accessing something, some energy, some creativity, whether it's with work or with painting or whatever we do. And you sort of think, gosh, you know, that's amazing. How, where did that come from? And it's it's lovely and it doesn't have to be explained. Um, but it yeah. is if we yeah. if we're more open to it. And sometimes, you know. Yeah easier more difficult yeah. but there comes there comes a question there comes a thought from somewhere mm. uh and and when you do art it's like a it's like it's it's happening and it's becoming something and then afterwards you can realize that that piece of art is meaning something which you didn't know when you were creating it yeah 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 lovely Thank you. Any other questions or insights or comments? Um, well, I, I can just uh, address um, working with tactile touch mm -hmm. um, uh, together with therapy and uh, obviously People get to know that I have done this as a professional, you know, for a couple of decades and also working as a nurse. Um, and for me, obviously, it's, it's not working intuitively because it has a structure mm -hmm. and an idea around it, a method. But working with a client that says yes to it, to the approach is being in the intuition and working with the healing of the trauma or the issue that is brought up in therapy. So I often um, use the, um, uh, the, the counseling at first and end with the, with the tactile touch. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I also do the other way around for the ones that are totally stuck in their heads. Uh, which most are, <laughs> I would say, uh, generalizing a little bit. But anyway, so it's uh, because then it's also it opens up quite a lot, and then it's beautiful to for some that are in in a in a place where they have a stability and a grounding after a couple of sessions or whatever. Um, it's lovely to get the tactile at the end and go home with it, and then we see each other the, the following week. And for the ones that find after a while that they can't, it's something still in, you know, it's so helpful to get the, uh, get the instrument of the body awareness um, together with the, the cognitive, you know, work. So yes, I, I find it even more pleasurable. Um, last couple of years to to be able to give this uh, because it's a silent treatment it's not like it's not an analytic um treatment and it sounds like for you it's very intuitive as well yeah. yes yeah. it's become more and more so from 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 my own experience and from my own work and i find you know my my own life yeah uh, working with with a that i can dare that to be professional but yet be more intuitive yeah for the client you know see what the legs are saying to me do they want more of, of the structure or the touch or the feet or what it, what it could be yes and I get very inspired of um working um giving um you know organizing a, um organizing something to, to give uh, voluntary therapy to people in the um, health environment. So if anyone is, is, um, is interested, give me a call, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I heard a little bit about that you tried, but why couldn't we? Of course we can.
That's yes, my, yeah. my, my, my inspiring, my, yeah. my inspiration from, from hearing you today. Oh, so thank you. you. I'm glad. Delighted. Yeah. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Oh, right. I was I was thinking just um, um, just to say that we we have maybe four minutes left uh, okay. until it's seven o'clock and and we uh, we don't want to to hold you over time. Um, uh, we're already very thankful that uh, that you agreed to meet us and to share your experiences and your knowledge with us. It's very beautiful and um, and very inspiring. And and also, uh, I would like to to thank you so much for this, and to and to say to everyone uh, what a beautiful gesture you you made by telling me that um, if we mobilize to do this in Sweden to give support in the way the frontline did, um, you're willing to donate your fee that that you would otherwise get for tonight uh, that would go to supervision of uh, therapists who will be part of that project mm -hmm. so now we have to we, we have, have to, to start something absolutely yeah you can't i mean it, it's actually morally wrong for you not to do it now. yeah 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 so, <laughs> so but if it works then i hope so yeah. Mm. Yeah. okay well i've really enjoyed talking to you all i mean it's as I say, it's my first experience of doing something that's like this big on, on here. So um, yeah, it wouldn't have been perfect, but I, I really have enjoyed seeing the different people and on the little screens and feeling you all there. And, and thank you, Mircha, too, for actually facilitating the questions and making it a sort of casual conversation. And, and thank you to Michael for all of your tech stuff, which is like not beyond me. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you for all being here too. And, and hearing about Frontline, because I feel quite passionate about offering something for people who are really struggling and, and really battling with something that we all want them to win at. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, um... I don't know how uh, how we can end this in a in a in a in a more better way. Um, maybe just I'll I'll put everything into uh, into gallery view, and I suggest uh, maybe everyone does that to to see everyone in here, and um, and maybe open the microphones and say a goodbye and a thank you to Shivan for. For, hearing, for being here with us. And uh, we will keep you posted with uh, how we evolve our work here in, uh, in Sweden with, with starting a, a volunteering organization. Um, and um, I forgot to say in the beginning that we record this meeting and we will post it on the association's um, YouTube. So if anyone doesn't want to appear there or um, have any comments, just let me know. Otherwise, I will, I will assume that that's a yes from everyone. And uh, yeah, thank you so much again, Siobhan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. so much. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. 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 Bye.